ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم وشر العمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار وبعد When the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wassalam passed away the companions of Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam were not in any doubt that he had completed the religion Upon the command of Allah Jalla wa ala, with the revelation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent to him, that he had completed that which Allah commanded of him. And Allah Jalla wa ala revealed the ayah, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al-Islam deena. That Allah sent down the verse in Surah Al-Ma'idah, that Allah mentioned this day, I have completed your religion for you, perfected my favor upon you, and I am pleased with Islam as your religion. So the companions were not in any doubt whatsoever that that which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent with, was completed, was perfected, and the religion required no more addition. That which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, Al-Yawma akamaltu lakum deenakum That this day I have completed your religion for you. That this in the eyes of the companions meant that there was nothing to be added any further to this religion of Al-Islam. So much so that Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala, the Imam of Darul Hijra, a century and a half later, who died in the year 179 after the Hijra, he mentioned that any individual who ascribes to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who ascribes to Islam, that this religion requires or is in need of any addition by way of ibadat, by way of any act of worship, seeking nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he has ascribed treachery to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi He has accused the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of khayana, meaning treachery and betrayal. Why? Because he said that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited the ayah, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmantu alaykum ni'mati, to the end of the ayah, this, this day I have perfected your religion for you, and I have completed my favor upon you, and I'm pleased with Islam is your religion. Knowing that the religion is complete, this means that there is no further requirement for this religion. That which the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left us upon is enough. So much so that the great companion Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu anhu, he said that the Messenger of Allah, not a bird flaps his wings in the sky except that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave us some knowledge concerning it before he, was, before he passed away, before Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala took his soul. So if Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam informed us even of information of a bird that flaps its wings in the sky then is there anything lesser than that or greater than that that he would have left out sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Nothing. So much so that our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us even the bathroom manners, the toilet manners. An individual, a Jew, he came to Salman al-Farsi and he said to Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu that you know your prophet, he even taught you the toilet manners. So far from being humiliated or humiliated, Salman al-Farsi, yes, he said, yes. He taught us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that when we relieve ourselves, we neither, we neither face the qibla, nor do we turn our backs to it. And when we cleanse ourselves, we use an odd number of stones. And in some narrations that we use our left hand. So here the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, taught them the toilet manners. Indeed, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, taught us and informed us of an affair that was going to last for 40 days. For 40 days, and he informed us of it. And that affair was the affair of the Dajjal, the Masih dajjal But the Masih dajjal or the Antichrist, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stated, there is no fitna that will occur upon this earth greater than the fitna of the Dajjal. He will be upon the earth for 40 days. The first day will be like a year, the second like a month, the third like a week, and the rest of them will be normal days. He will travel like the clouds or the wind travels. He will come with something in his right. 
that will, that will be something resembling paradise. And he will come with something in his left. And that will resemble something of the fire. When you are presented with one or the other, then choose the fire. Choose the fire. Do not choose his Jannah. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu informed us of him. He said, do not approach him. If the Dajjal appears whilst I'm ready, whilst I'm here amongst you, then I will confront him. I will deal with him. And if he was to appear after I've gone, then do not approach him. As the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam said, for indeed a man will go to him, believing himself to be firm in iman, a believer, not to be shaken by doubt. And he will come back in some narrations full of doubts. In other narrations, having lost his religion. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu informed us of an event that hadn't taken place. That was going to occur before the hour. He informed us of its details. And that is the appearance of the Dajjal. And that which comes after the Dajjal. Such as the descent of Isa ibn Maryam. Towards the end of the period of the Mahdi. And after the Dajjal has appeared. He sallallahu alayhi wa informed us of the coming of, of Ya'juj wa Ma'juj. These two tribes, Gog and Magog, that will come out from the east. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa informed us of all of these affairs, leaving nothing to chance, nothing for our own intellect. Once the Sharia has made an affair clear, then there is no need for an individual to bring his opinions. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa taught you that when you enter your wives, how to supplicate. He taught you when your children are born, what to do on the seventh day, to name them on the seventh day, to circumcise them on the seventh day, to perform the aqiqah on the seventh day, to shave their heads on the seventh day. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa did not leave anything except that he made it clear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarified the religion upon the tongue of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa So much so at the final hajj, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he said to his companions, do you not bear witness that I have conveyed? They said, indeed we bear witness. So then he pointed towards the heavens. Because that is where Allah is. Above the seven heavens, over his throne. He did not point in a direction where Allah is not. He pointed in a direction where he knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is high above. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is high above. Distinct ba'in min khalqihi. As has been mentioned by Sufyan al-Thawri. And Abu Hatim and Abu Zur'a al-Razi. That Allah Jalla wa Ala is high above. So then he mentioned, Oh Allah, bear witness. Bear witness to what? To the fact that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qad balagd. That indeed I have conveyed. So he conveyed that which was upon him. So no one can come later and say that our religion is imperfect. Our religion has gaps or holes that need filling. Or there are places where we need to add acts of worship into. So Islam, for example, does not accept any innovation whatsoever. So there is no room for a person to come along and say, well, there's an act of innovation, or there is an act which the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not do, but I will do it. And then you say to him, why will you do it? He said, because Allah loves it. Then you inform them that it is not possible for you to do any act of worship that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not do. And then you claim that indeed Allah loves it. For indeed Allah does not love anything that involves innovation. Anything that questions the perfection and the completeness of this religion. The companions of Allah's Messenger وسلم, passed away. Radiallahu anhum. Whilst being upon guidance. Not a single one of them was an innovator. Not a single one of them innovated. But every single one of them was a follower. Was a muttabi'. Every single one of the companions followed that which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa were upon. And when they differed in any affair between themselves, then they referred it back to Allah and His Messenger. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned the Qur'an, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَتِيُوا اللَّهُ وَأَتِيُوا رُسُولُ وَأُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنْ تَنَازَأْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرُسُولِ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in this ayah, O oh, you who believe, obey Allah and obey the Messenger, and those in authority amongst you. Allah Jalla wa ala only used the word ati' twice. He did not use it three times. He said, obey Allah, obey the Messenger, and those in authority. So that shows as Ibn Kathir, and the ulama such as Ibn Baz, and Ibn Thaymin, and others have mentioned, 
that the obedience to Allah is an obligation unconditional. You have no choice in the affair. The obedience to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is an obligation unconditional. You have no choice in the matter. Obedience to those in authority is only in accordance to the obedience to Allah and His Messenger وسلم. So if those in authority, and those in authority are two types of people, the ulama and the umara, the scholars and the rulers. The obedience to the scholars and the obedience to the rulers is only if their obedience is in accordance with the kitab and the sunnah. If it opposes the kitab and the sunnah, then what do we give precedence to? We give precedence to the kitab and the sunnah. We don't give precedence to those in authority in that affair. It does not mean that we remove our respect from them. It does not mean that we remove the hand of obedience from them. But it means that our unconditional obedience and servitude is to the command of Allah Jalla wa ala. And that which he conveyed to his messenger or revealed to his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the shahid or the point of evidence here is that which follows. فَإِن تَنَازَتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ uh, If you differ in any affair between yourselves, then refer it back to Allah and his messenger if you believe in Allah in the last day. Listen to these words of the messenger. Who are these ayat revealed upon? They were revealed upon the companions of Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That the companions were informed if you, the companions of Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam, if you differ in any affair, then take it back to Allah and His Messenger. You not put your own opinion before the opinion of Allah and His, before the statement of Allah and the statement of His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Don't put your opinions in front of their opinions. And that's why when the companions used to dispute with each other, not that it occurred often, because the companions they had with amongst them, the greatest amount of harmony and the greatest amount of brotherhood. But they differed occasionally. Especially in the, not in the usul of the deen, but in the furu of the deen. And in the branches of the religion, if they ever differed in an affair, then what did they used to do? Put their own opinion forward? When they differed with each other? No. They used to say, that if we differ, let's take it back to Allah and His Messenger. Because this was the attitude of the believers of that time. And that's why you find that narration from Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma that has been collected by the great scholars of the Salaf, and has been noted by Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab rahimahullahu ta'ala in his kitab al-Tawheed, that they mention the statement of Abdullah ibn Abbas. When Abdullah ibn Abbas, some of the people, they came to him, and they said to him, regarding some questions pertaining to Hajj. So then he gave the ruling in accordance with the Hajj al tamattu This is the Hajj in which the Hajj and the Umrah are combined. So some of the people around Abdullah ibn Abbas, they said, but Abu Bakr and Umar, they used to say something else. So what did he say, Abdullah ibn Abbas? That's okay, Abu Bakr and Umar, because they're more senior to me. They were more senior to him. No one upon the dunya, no one amongst mankind, is more excellent than Abu Bakr, after the prophets and messengers. He is the greatest and the most excellent of mankind, after the prophets and messengers. And then after him, Umar, then after him, Uthman, then after him, the rest of the seven who were promised Jannah, Ali, and Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, and Talha and Zubair, and Abu Ubaid ibn al Jarrah, and the rest of those companions amongst the ten, radiallahu anhum. Nevertheless, when this issue was brought to Abdullah ibn Abbas, when he gave the ruling for Hajj, in accordance to the hadith of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, and some of the people they said, but Abu Bakr, but Umar, he said, Allahu Akbar. I say to you that the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam said, and your answer to me is but Abu Bakr and but Umar. By Allah I fear that stones will rain down from the sky upon your heads. That I say to you that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, and you say to me but Abu Bakr and but Umar. This is Abdullah ibn Abbas. Does that mean Abdullah ibn Abbas had no respect for Abu Bakr and Umar? The country. He loved them more than he loved himself. He would put them before he put himself. He would honor them before he honored himself. He gave bay'ah to both of them when they were leaders. But he understood that our love for them and our respect for them, our veneration of them, our honor of them, our ihtiram for them does not necessitate now 
that we disobey the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this was the way of all of the salaf of this ummah. And that's why you find the likes of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. That when one of his students, Ya'qub, or Abu Ya'qub, when he was writing, he said, woe, woe upon you that you write down everything that I say. For indeed I may hold an opinion today and I may alter it tomorrow in accordance with the revelation. The same position of as Imam Shafi'i. He said, إِذَا صَحْ الْحَدِيثِ فَهُوَ مَذْهَبِي If the hadith is sahih, then that is my madhab. What is the madhab of the salaf? The madhab of the salaf is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu That which the Prophet sallallahu said, that which is narrated from him by way of his statements and his deeds and his actions and his tacit approvals. That is the way of the salaf of this ummah. The same as the statement of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, لا تقلدوني ولا تقلدوا مالك ولا شافي ولا شافي ولا مالك ولا 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 ثوري ولا عوزائي do not blindly follow me, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Do not blindly follow me. Is there anything clearer than that? They say, no, we're going to blindly follow you. He said, don't blindly follow me. We don't care what he says, but then still going to blindly follow him. Imam Ahmad, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal himself. Do not blindly follow me. And do not blindly follow Imam Shafi'i. And no Imam Malik. No Imam Sufyan al thawri No Imam al awzai the great illustrious imams of the first and second or the second and third century. This is the statement of Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And then he ended up by saying, rather take from where they took. Where did they take from? The book and the sunnah. And they took from the way of the salaf. And that's why Imam al awzai used to say, in his creed that has been reported by Imam al lalikai in his sharh usul al-tiqad ahl sunnah he said, stop where the people before you stopped. For indeed that which suffice them is sufficient for you. Who are the people before him? He said the Salaf. What is sufficient for them is sufficient for you. The same as the statement of Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala. The Imam Malik, he mentioned that the latter part of this Ummah will not be rectified except that which rectified its earliest part. When you speak to the people of today, those so-called callers to Allah in our times, those rectifiers, the du'at of the sahwa as they describe themselves, the du'at of the Islamic awakening, that you find from their behavior that these individuals will cut the youth of this generation off from those early illustrious statements that I've mentioned. They have no concern with them. Their concern is for the political advancement in our times. Now when they enter into the political arena, and to the arena of da'wah in our times, then it is convenient for them, not to mention all of these affairs of going back to the way of the Salaf. Convenient for them. And it is politically convenient for them, not to mention the way of the Salaf of this Ummah. Not to mention the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Not to mention the Aqaid, or the books of creed of the early Salaf. The Aqeedah of Imam Malik, or Sufyan al tawri Abu Hatim al-Razi, Abu Zura al-Razi, Sufyan al tawri Imam al awzai Abdullah ibn Mubarak. It is convenient for them not to mention that. Because once they start mentioning those narrations, authentically reported from the works of the early scholars, then they, un then they will realize that the people of today will flee from their da'wah. They will run away from them. Because the da'wah of the people of today, the vast majority of them, calls to other than the way of the Sahaba, other than the way of Malik, other than the way of Shafi'i, other than the way of Ibn Mubarak, other than the way of those early illustrious Imams. So yes, the Ummah in our times is divided. I don't think I have to go through a huge discussion to prove that the Ummah is divided. Just walk out into the street and you'll see. As many as there are streets in Manchester, they are probably sects in Manchester. Sectarianism in Islam, as Abu Umama al-Bahili, radiallahu anhu, the great companion, when he was walking out, or walking towards rather, the great mosque in Damascus, in his time the companion, he saw that there were stakes in the ground, sticks in, in the ground. Upon these sticks were the beheaded heads of the Khawarij, a sect of misguidance. The rulers of that time, they beheaded them, because the Khawarij, 
were responsible for the rebellion and overthrow of the Muslim governments of that time. They were responsible for the killing of Uthman radiallahu anhum right in his house. They surrounded his house. Some of the scholars say for 20 days. Some of the scholars say for 40 days. And they besieged Uthman radiallahu anhu in his home. And then they entered his home and they killed him. His wife tried to protect him. He was close to 90 years old. Over 90 years old. And his wife, the wife of Uthman, she raised her hand as the blow came down upon Uthman. As she raised her hand, they sliced off all of her fingers of her hand. And then they took another blow. And then they finished Uthman radiallahu anhu af. These khawarij. Why? Because they said Uthman is not ruling correctly in the manner that we want. Then after they killed Uthman, then they came the reign of Ali. And then they killed Ali radiallahu anhu. They assassinated him. After Ali took an army against them. Then one of them assassinated him. Another one he stabbed Hassan bin Ali ibn Abi Talib in his leg, in his thigh. And they continued in this manner. So when the time came and the latter time of the Sahaba, and from them was Abu Umam al-Bahili radiallahu anhu, that he saw that the Khawarij, this sect, this rebellious, is present today even in our times. He found that, they, that their heads had been decapitated. And they'd been placed upon stakes leading into the pathway to the Grand Mosque in, in, in Damascus. He saw them. And he looked at them. And then he said, Indeed I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Hum kilabun nar. Hum kilabun nar. Hum kilabun nar. And he repeated it three times. Indeed they are the dogs of the hellfire. They are the dogs of the hellfire. They are the dogs of the hellfire. Referring to whom? Referring to those individuals whose heads had been cut. And their heads had been placed upon stakes. And then he started weeping. Because he realized, look how shaitan leads astray the son of Adam. These individuals who took the shahada, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Then after entering into the fold of Islam, shaitan led them astray. Like you see in our times, sometimes a new Muslim will enter into Islam from Christianity, from Judaism, from Hinduism, from Sikhism. And then within a year, he regards himself to be the vanguard of Islam. That he is ready to strap semtex upon his body and blow himself up. Within a year, within a year of Islam, how shaitan leads them astray. This is deviation. A deviation that shaitan calls them to. Due to their ignorance. Due to their lack of knowledge. So then they enter into these pathways of misguidance. So when he saw them, and he shed tears at the state of the children of Adam after entering into Islam, then he said, indeed I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa say, that the Jews they split up into 71 sects, the Christians they split up into 72 sects, and this Ummah will split up into 73 sects, kulluhum finnar, every single one of them is in the hellfire. Except for one. Illa wahida wa hiya al-jama'ah. Except for one. And that is the jama'ah. And then he mentioned to his companion who was next to him. He said, look. The Jews they split up into 71. The Christians they split up into 72. And the ummah of Muhammad is more sectarian than the Jews and the Christians. There are more sects amongst the Muslims than there are amongst the Jews and Christians. And the one that is saved amongst them is the jama'ah. We are not in a position, my brothers and sisters, to ignore this hadith. Because this hadith was mentioned by the companions of Allah's Messenger. And it was utilized by the companions of Allah's Messenger. Who was the jama'ah in that time? In the time of the Sahaba. When Abdullah ibn Mubarak, rahimahullah ta'ala, the great Imam who died in the year 181 after the Hijrah, Abdullah ibn Mubarak was asked, Who is the jama'ah? He said, The jama'ah is Abu Bakr and Umar. So the people said, Qad mata Abu Bakr wa Umar. 
The Abu Bakr and Umar are dead. Then he said, then the jama'ah is so and so and so and so. They said, well, so and so and so and so is also dead. Then he said, the jama'ah is Abu Hamza, al sukkari al Khurasani, the great Imam and the teacher, the teacher of Abdullah ibn Mubarak from Khurasan of that era. So they understood what the jama'ah was. The jama'ah is that which was represented by Abu Bakr and Umar and the companions radiallahu anhum. The jama'ah is represented by those who came after them, who held on to the truth. This is the jama'ah that Abu Umama al-Bahili radiallahu anhu was talking about when he mentioned that the Muslims will split up more than the Jews, more than the Christians. All of them will enter into the hellfire except for one and it is the jama'ah. The great companion, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he mentioned a hadith, or he mentioned an occurrence that took place whilst the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was alive. He mentioned, خَطَّ لَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ خَطًا ثُمَّ قَالَ هَذَا سَبِيلُ اللَّهِ That the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa drew for us a line. And then he said, this is the straight path of Allah. Then he drew lines to the right, then he drew lines to the left. And then he said, هَذِهِ سُبُلُ الْمُتَّفَرِّقَ These are paths which are divergent and separating paths. And then he said, عَلَى كُلِّ سَبِيلٍ عَلَى كُلِّ سَبِيلٍ Upon the head of every single path, مِنْهَا شَيْطَانٍ يَدْعُوا إِلَيْهِ Upon the head of each of those dividing paths, there is a devil at the head of them calling you to it. Calling to that path. What we understand from this hadith, is that the Messenger of Allah drew one line in the sand and he mentioned that this is the path of Allah. Then when he drew the other paths, he called them divergent, deviated paths. At the head of each one of them is a devil calling to it. Imagine my brothers and sisters, that if there was a, a line that is drawn straight down, because this is something that is important for us to note, a line drawn in the sand, then the Messenger of Allah draw lines away from that one path, to the right and to the left, as Abdullah ibn Mas'ud mentioned. Then he mentioned at the head of each one of those lines, there's a devil calling to it. Which head? Are we looking at the end of the line, or are we looking at the beginning of the line, closest to the straight path? Which of the two? Imagine, there's the lines going that way, there's the center line. The lines are going that way. Where is the shaitan standing? At the line that is at the end of those short lines that are closest to the line, the straight path or further away? Closest. Why? Because they are calling to those paths. They call to those paths, my brothers and sisters, those shayateen, because they are standing close to the straight path. They are cl standing close to the truth. And then they call people and they say, look, we have something that resembles the truth. We have something that resembles the truth. Come to us. Then you embark upon that path. Then where does that path take you? Closer to the straight path or further away? Further away. Where's the proof for this? This proof for this is in the behavior or in that incident that took place in the time of the companions. In the time when Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu, the companion, he entered the masjid in Iraq. He entered the masjid and he saw the people counting. They were sitting in circles and they were counting stones. One of them would pick up a stone. And he would say, Alhamdulillah. Then the people in the circle would repeat after him, Alhamdulillah. Then he would pick up and he would repeat that a hundred times and the people repeat after him a hundred times. Then he would pick up another stone and say, Subhanallah. Then the people would repeat after him, Subhanallah, a hundred times. Then likewise, Allahu Akbar. Illa ilaha illallah. Dhikr. Is there anything wrong with dhikr? Nothing wrong with dhikr. So they are making the adhkar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remembering Allah, as Allah Jalla wa'ala has commanded. That's what they felt. So then Abu Musa al-Ashari didn't say a word. What did he do? He went to the to a companion who was greater than him, who he himself saw to be greater than him, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. So he went to the house of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and he was the waqt of Fajr. It was the time of Fajr. And he waited outside the house of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. When Abdullah ibn Mas'ud came out, 
He said, I have seen something in the masjid. He said, what did you see? He said, I saw something, I've never seen it before. By Allah, it looked good. It seemed good. Why? Because they're making dhikr. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, let us go and see. So he went. He came upon one of the circles. And he saw them counting the pebbles. Just like you see the people doing even now till this day. So what did Abdullah ibn Mas'ud say to them? Did he say to them, MashaAllah, even though we've never done it before, it looks good. We're making dhikr. Is there anything better than saying, La ilaha illallah, Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar. Nothing better. But he didn't say that to them. Look at the words of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He said, O oh, Ummah of Muhammad, how quickly you run to your destruction. How quickly you run to your destruction. Indeed, the companions of Allah's Messenger are still alive. His clothes are still not worn out. And his utensils have not yet broken. Have not yet broken. Either you are upon a religion better than the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or you are a path upon a path of deviation which one of the two do you think it is better than Muhammad is there any guidance better than the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never so that only leaves one choice but then a person will say well why what is wrong with making dhikr in that manner what is wrong with it my brothers and sisters is that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he completed that which Allah had placed upon him. Allah perfected the religion, completed his favor. There is no need to add anything to the religion, the religion that is perfect and complete. So they added, what did they add? Is it the dhikr? Not the dhikr. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, in one of the narrations, he said, rather, you should count your evil deeds. For indeed, Allah will not cause your good deeds to be wasted. One of them, he turned to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Look at the answer. The answer of the sincere person when he hears a companion. When he hears the truth. From who? From a companion of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That the answer of that person is, you people, you are with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you know better. Show us our mistake. We will not repeat the mistake. Look at their answer. They answered, but we only intended good. So they referred it back to what? What was in their hearts? Same thing you hear from the people today. Why are you celebrating the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ for? He didn't celebrate it. His companions didn't celebrate it. The Tabi'een didn't celebrate it. The Atba'u Tabi'een didn't celebrate it. The four Imams, they didn't celebrate it. For the first seven centuries of Islam, the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ was not celebrated. Why are you celebrating it? They said, our intention is good. Same thing that those people said to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. But we only intend good. His answer, how many people intend good, but they never reach it. Because as we mentioned the khutbah today, that an action, for it to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, must have two conditions. The first one is ikhlas, sincerely for Allah. Okay, your heart has to be correct. For the face of Allah, for the sake of Allah that you're doing this act of ibadah. Secondly, that it must be in accordance to the sunnah of Allah's messenger, mutaba'a. That he must follow the sunnah of Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Otherwise, he will not be accepted. So they had the first part, which was ikhlas. So they claimed. And the second part, did they have it? No. Because Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, how many people intend good, but they never reach it? Because they didn't follow the sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ never counted stones. He never counted beads. He never did any of this stuff that you're seeing around. Even till today. Hasn't stopped. He didn't do any of that. Not only that, my brothers and sisters, Abdullah Masood didn't stop there. He said, by Allah, I heard the Messenger of Allah ﷺ say, that a group of people will appear. And they will recite the Quran. And it will not go beyond their collarbones. It will not go beyond their collarbones. And I fear that you are from them. So then the narrator of the hadith, he said, or the author, he said, by Allah, those very same people who are counting stones in the masjid, I saw them on the day of Naharawan 
in an army that was fighting against Ali radiallahu anhu. Look where shaitan began. Look. Remember the line? The line is close to the straight path. So they stand close to the straight path and they say, Look, we're upon something that resembles the truth. Come to us. So then you go to them. Are they going to keep you close to the straight path? No. Now they've got you upon their path. They're going to take you further and further and further away. Just like those people. They began by counting stones. What did they finish up with? Killing the companions of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. On the day after or those days of fitting, those days of tribulation, when those people rebelled against Ali and they cut open the belly of Abdullah, the son of Khabbab ibn Arat, they cut open the belly of his wife when she was pregnant, heavily pregnant. They cut it open, they pulled out the fetus and they threw it into the river. And the river was red with the blood of the wife of Abdullah. And they killed him likewise and they threw him into the river, the son of a companion. Why? Because he narrated a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that they did not like. So then they started shedding blood. And they declared Ali to be a kafir. Where did they begin my brothers? Counting stones. Some of them, not all of them. Some of them began by counting stones in the masjid. And they did not take the advice of Abdullah ibn, uh, Abdullah, um, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. So when it came to that time when they started shedding blood, Abdullah ibn Abbas said to Ali, let me go and talk to them. Let me go and talk to them. So he went. Ali did not like it initially. He said, I fear they will kill you. They will harm you. He said, no, no, I have some, they have some respect for me. Let me go. So he said, I put on my best Yemeni cloth. So, and I put on the best sandals that I had. He oiled and perfumed himself. And he went into the camp of the Khawarij. Those who had said, La ilaha illallah. And then shaitan led them astray. He entered into the camp. He said, I could hear the humming like the beehive due to their dhikr. I looked at them and their hand and their foreheads were scarred and their hands had calluses and blisters upon them, likewise their knees. Their eyes were sunken and dark due to their staying up through the night in the worship of Allah. They had marks upon their foreheads and they looked, up, and they looked upon me and they said, what is this that you're wearing? They didn't like the clothing that he was wearing. Companion! This clothing of the people of dunya. He said, indeed, I saw the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa wearing clothing like this clothing. Why? Because he's a companion. He knows. They're going to argue with him. None of them saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He saw him. He said, you criticize me? I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa wearing a cloth similar to this cloth. So they remained quiet. Then he said to them, What do you have? What do you have with the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with the cousin of the Messenger of Allah? What do you have with the son-in-law of the Messenger of Allah? What's your problem with him? Indeed, I've come from a group of people amongst whom the Qur'an was revealed. And I do not see a single one of them amongst you. Not one companion? They split away from the companions. Some of the scholars, they mention that up to 20,000. Others of them say up to 6,000. But nevertheless, thousands of them, they split away from the body of the companions. And they went to one side. So Abdullah ibn Abbas, the first hujja, which was what? The I have come from the companions of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I do not see a single companion of Allah's Messenger amongst you. That is sufficient as a hujjah. Sufficient as an evidence and a proof against them. You could not convince a single companion to join you. Not one companion would join you in your deviation. Well, not one companion could you convince. So who is more knowledgeable? All of those companions that are united. All of those companions. And the scholars like Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah and others, they mention that when it came to the issue of those who opposed the rule of Ali 
from the Khawarij. Not a single one of the companions withheld from supporting Ali. Not one companion. Yet not a single companion joined the Khawarij, the people of deviation, who asked for the removal and for the beheading and the killing of Ali radiallahu anhu. Not one companion joined them. It shows my brothers and sisters the importance of knowing what united those individuals. What was it? At the end of the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, remember the hadith that we mentioned. When the Prophet ﷺ drew a line in the sun, he said, هذا سبيل الله. This is the straight path of Allah. Then he drew lines to the right and drew lines to the left. And he said, هذه سبل متفرقة. That these are divergent paths. At the head of each one of them, there is a devil calling to it. Whenever the devil calls you to misguidance, he does not call you from afar. He calls you from near. From something that you already recognize. He does not call you from Baid. Here, yeah, I'm standing by the hellfire, come with me. No. He'll call you with something that you know to be the truth. But it resembles the truth. Not exactly the truth, but near enough. So that you find it difficult to decipher. Then he puts you on a path of deviation, step by step by step. This is how it begins. This is how it begins. At the end of that narration, the Mis uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited the statement of Allah, وَأَنَّ هَذَا سِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا سُبَلْ فَاتَّفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ He mentioned the statement of Allah, and this is my straight path, so follow it, and do not follow the other paths, for they will divide you away from his straight path, from the straight path of Allah. So how many paths are there for Allah? One. One. One path. Sabil. He didn't say subal. Sabil. Singular. And when he mentioned sirat. Singular. Huh? Sirat al mustaqim The straight path of Allah. So now we understand that the path of Allah is one path. The messenger of Allah came with one religion. He came as he drew that line in the sand showing us that there is one way. And this is the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, and do not follow the other paths, for they will divide you away from Allah's straight path. So no doubt, my brothers and sisters, we understand from these narrations that the ummah indeed will split. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, he said, that the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu was salam stated, سَتَفْتَرِقُ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ عَلَىٰ ثَلَاثٍ وَسَبْعِينَ فِرْقَةٍ كُلُّهَا فِي النَّارِ إِلَّا وَاحِدَةٍ قَالُوا وَمَا هِيَ تِلْقَ الْفِرْقَةِ قَالْ مَا أَنَا عَلَيْهِ الْيَوْمُ أَسْحَابِي That the Prophet ﷺ said that indeed this ummah of mine or this ummah will divide into 73 sects. Now before we continue, obviously you know the rest of the hadith. But before we remove, before we continue with the rest of the hadith, the term ummah here. Many of the people who have not understood the hadith and do not understand the statements of the Salaf, and do not connect themselves to the books of the early Salaf, like Imam Ahmed, Rasulul Sunnah, or the books of Imam al-Barbahari, Sharh al-Sunnah, or Imam al-Lalikai, the encyclopedia of the Aqeedah, Sharh al-Sul al-Tiqad ahl sunnah or the rest of the books, Asul al-Sunnah of Abu Hatim and Abu Zurra, Raziyain, that when a person reads those books, they begin to understand that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa is talking about the Muslims when he said, سَتَفْتَرِقُ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ My Ummah. Why? Because the Ummah is of two types. The Ummah to da'wa and the Ummah to ijaba The Ummah to da'wa is the whole of mankind and jinn. Because that's the Ummah whom the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa came to give da'wa to. The jinn and the mankind. So he called all of them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to ibadah. Then there is a part of that portion of the jinn and mankind that accepted. And they are called the Ummatul Ijaba, the Ummah that responded. So the Ummatul Da'wa is the whole of mankind and the jinn. The Ummatul Ijaba is a body within mankind and jinn that answered the call of the Messenger of Allah and accepted the Da'wa. So when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, mentioned, Satafariku Hadihil Ummah, that this Ummah will divide into 73 sects. Then he's talking about which ummah? The ummah to da'wa or the ummah to ijaba? Which one? Ijaba. The ummah that responded. 
So the Muslims, they divided, or they will divide into 73 sects. All of them into the hellfire, except for one. So the companions, they said, which is that one, Ya Rasulullah? Now the question here, before we move on, is why would the companions want to know which is the one? Are not the companions already from those who are saved? Yes or no? Man is saved. They are with the Messenger of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned them in the Quran. وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنْسَارِ وَالَّذِينَ تَبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوا عَنْهُ The first and foremost to embrace Islam from the Muhajirun and from the Ansar and those who follow them in goodness. Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Him. So the companions, they are already from those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preferred and He's pleased with. He will enter them into the gardens of paradise under which rivers flow to remain therein for eternity. And that is the greatest success or the supreme success. So that's what Allah mentions in this ayah in Surah Tawbah. Now the question is, why would the companions who already know that Allah is pleased with them, why would they ask? Because of the concern. Because they were not people, my brothers and sisters, like you find Muslims today. They think, khalas, I said, La ilaha illallah, I'm from Ahlul Jannah already. Companions were not like that. Even Abi Mulaika, rahimahullah ta'ala from the Tabi'een, he said that I met the companions of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he mentioned a number of them. He, he mentioned the hadith, this author is in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari. He said that I did not meet a single one of them except that he feared hypocrisy for himself. Companions. Because they were not individuals, my brothers and sisters, who felt that they are already in Jannah before they've entered into Jannah. They were people who were striving throughout the whole of their life. Like Umar ibn al-Khattab. And I'm sure many of you have heard those narrations when he was the Amir al-Mu'mineen. And he used to go out in the night time to see how the subjects, how the Muslims are bearing in times of famine, in times of ease, in times of drought. On an occasion, Aslam, from those who used to serve Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, Afwan, Talha bin Ubaidillah radiallahu anhu, he said on an occasion that I followed Umar ibn al-Khattab as he left his home when he was the Amir al-Mu'mineen. And he entered into a house from amongst the mud houses. And I waited up until he exited. And then he said, I, I entered the following morning. And I saw a woman there, an old woman. He's the Amir al-Mu'mineen. She was an old woman. He said that I saw that she was blind. And she was crippled. And she could not easily move herself from place to place. He said, I looked at her and I asked her, may I ask you? She said, ask. He said, what did that man want from you yesterday? She said, oh, that man. Yeah, that man always comes. He takes away the bowl in which I relieve myself in the night and empties it for me. He gets my food ready and he feeds me. Then he leaves. So Talha bin Ubaidillah said, Ya Talha. Who is the one that you are following? Why are you trying to chase him up for? Why are you following him? On another occasion, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he went out when he was the Amir al-Mu'mineen. And this has been narrated by Aslam, his servant, or his companion. He said that I went with Umar ibn Khattab to the outskirts of Medina. And he entered into like a a covering, like a tent kind of thing, which was just held up by sticks. And there was a woman there. And she had with her her children. And she was heating something upon the fire. And the children were crying around her. So Umar said to her, she did not know that he was Umar ibn Khattab. So Umar said to her, Oh woman, what are you doing? She said, I'm boiling some water. He said, why are the children crying? She said, my children are hungry. She said, my children are hungry. She said, so I boil the water to let make them think that I'm cooking something for them. So they will cry and cry and then fall asleep out of exhaustion. 
Umar started weeping. She said, Yawm al I will meet Umar. So Umar left with Aslam. And he went to the place where the granary was for the Muslims. He filled a bag with flour and with fat and with butter. And he put it upon his back and he was an old man. So Aslam said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, let me carry it for you. He said, will you carry my burden on Yawm al-Qiyamah? Ya Aslam, will you be able to carry my burden? Leave me alone. So he carried it all the way to the outskirts of Medina. He told the lady, you sit down. He got the pot and he cooked the food. He made the flour. He put the butter in. He fed it himself to her children. And he got the rest of the bag and he left it for her. And then he went. Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu. These are the companions of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These are the ones that we have been commanded to emulate and to follow. There is no wonder that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned them. وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنْصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوَانِ The first and foremost to embrace Islam, the Muhajirun, the Ansar, and then those who follow them. They are the ones whom Allah is pleased with. They are the ones whom Allah will enter into Jannah. You can only be one of three people, my brothers and sisters, if you want to be from the people of Jannah. You can only be one of three to enter into Jannah. Either you are from the Muhajireen, from the time of the companions of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and all of them have died. So you can't be from them. Or you have to be from the Ansar, the people of Medina. Those companions of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you can't be them either. Because all of them have died. That only leaves one option. Those who follow them precisely in goodness. That's the only category left for us. If we are not of this category, who follow the companions of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in belief, in statement, in action, in piety, in taqwa, in the love of Allah, in the love of our neighbors, in the love of the Muslims, those who follow the sunnah, then you cannot be from amongst them. You cannot be a Shia or a Shi'i, one who follows the madhab of the Shia and claim that you are in this third category. Not possible. Because the Shia, they hate the Mahajirun and they hate the Ansar, except for a handful of them. You cannot be from the Khawarij and follow them. Because the Khawarij, they try to kill them. And they continue till this day, following in their footsteps. You cannot be a person who worships the graves and calls upon the inhabitants of the graves and claim that you are from them. Because none of the companions worship the graves. Not a single one of them worshipped at the grave of the Prophet wasallam. Never mind the grave of anyone lesser than them. Never. So then what have you, what do you have to be? You have to be upon certainty that those companions of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were the best of mankind and they are the most worthy of being followed. So that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stated that this ummah will divide into 73 sects. All of them into the hellfire except for one. So the companion said, which is that one firqa? وَمَا هِيَ تِلْقَ الْفِرْقَ Which is that one firqa? What do they call it? They call it a firqa. And that's why it's called firqa tul najiyah The saved sect. So some of the people say, which sect do you belong to? Then you should say to them, if you're talking about sects, then, then I belong. And I tried my best to adhere to the sect about whom the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said that they are saved. So when they asked the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, which is that saved sect that is saved? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, مَا أَنَا عَلَيْهِ الْيَوْمَ أَسْحَابِ 
that which I and my companions are upon today. Is there anything clearer than that, my brothers and sisters? You want to know what will save you. You want to know that what, what will protect you from the hellfire. What will prevent that dipping into the hellfire? Or that burning in the hellfire? Or that crushing in the grave? What will protect you from it is following the footsteps of the companions. That, that society that was raised by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, better than a father would raise his own children. Over 120,000 of them. Every single one of them for us an example. Collectively they could never be wrong. Individually, yes. They can be erroneous in their ishtihad. Collectively the Sahaba could never be wrong. It was about them that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, that my ummah will never unite upon dalala. My nation will never unite upon misguidance. He was referring to his companions. He wasn't referring to you and me. As Ibn Taymiyyah, Imam Ahmed. And in our time, Shaykh Al-Albani, rahimahullah, mentioned that this unity upon the haqq is, from the, is for the companions of Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now, those companions about whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated, وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِ رَسُولًا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِي خَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُسْلِهِ جَهَنَّمَ وَسَاءَتْ مَسِيرًا Whomsoever opposes the Messenger of Allah, after the guidance has been conveyed to him, then he chooses a path, other than the path of the companions of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then Allah will leave him in the path that he has chosen and burn him in the hellfire and what an evil destination. So sectarianism began, but salvation was by sticking to the companions. Whilst the companions were alive, four sects arose. Whilst they were alive, the first of them was the Khawarij, the murderers of Uthman and the murderers of Ali. Then there arose the Shia, those who claimed that Ali was divine. Until this day they claim that Ali is divine. And all of the rest of the companions, bar one or two, are all hypocrites and disbelievers. That's the Shia. The other sect that arose in that time was the Qadariya. Those who said, those who said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not know of an affair up until it occurs. So they denied the Qadr of Allah or the pre decree of Allah. Before I continue, there's a car, a black. Corsa, Vauxhall Corsa, SA59, OKH. Someone has, Allahu Musta'an, someone has smashed the window of that car. So if that's your car, then Allah give you better. The Qadriya, those who denied the pre decree of Allah, also in the time of the Sahaba, they arose the Murji'ah, who believed that actions direct a person's iman. These four sects arose in the time of the companions. Then as Imam al-Barbahari rahimahullah he mentioned, then more were added. The Mu'tazila, the Jahmiya, the Mujassima, the Mushabbiha, the Kullabiya, the Ash'ariya, the Lafdiya. All of these sects, the sects of Tasawwuf and Sufiya, all of these sects arose and they multiplied into dozens and then into 72. And those 72 further divided and they became thousands of different sects. All deviated away from the way of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So no doubt my brothers and sisters that we are obligated to stick to the kitab and the sunnah. And I want to finish upon the statement of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or two statements of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa sallam. Now on an occasion Irbad ibn Sariya the companion, he mentioned, وَعَذَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَعَذَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَوْعِدَةً ذَرَفَتْ مِنْهَا الْأَيُونَ وَوَجِلَتْ مِنْهَا الْقُلُوبِ فَقُلْنَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِنَّ هَذِهِ لَمَوْعِدَةُ مُوَدِّعٍ فَمَاذَا تَعْهُدْ إِلَيْنَا He said, that our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam delivered a sermon an admonition that was so strong that our eyes shed tears 
and our hearts they trembled. So we said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, this is as if it is a farewell sermon, a farewell admonition. So what do you advise us with? So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, قَدْ تَرَكْتُكُمْ عَلَى الْبَيْدَى لَيْلِهَا كَنَهَارِهَا Indeed, I have left you upon clear proof. Its night is like its day. لَا يَزِيغُ عَنْهَا بَعْدِ إِلَّا هَالِكُ And no one strays away from it except that he is destroyed. وَمَنْ يَعِيشْ مِنْكُمْ فَسَيَارَ اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِمَا عَرَفْتُمْ مِنْ سُنَّتِي وَمِنْ سُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءَ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيينَ That the Messenger of Allah said, And whomsoever from amongst you lives for long, then he will see a great amount of differing and division. So upon you is to stick to, know, stick to that which you know of my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided successors after me, the Khulafa al-Rashidin, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali. Addu alayha bin nawajid and hold on to that with your molar teeth. Hold on to that with your molar teeth. وَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالطَّاعَةِ And upon you is obedience. Meaning to the ruler. وَإِنْ أَبْدًا حَبَشِيًّا Even if your ruler is an Abyssinian slave in a narration, even if it is a deformed Abyssinian slave that is your ruler, then upon you is to obey him. فَإِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُ كَالْجَمَلِ الْأَنِفِ For indeed the believer is like a submissive camel. Wherever he is led, he follows in accordance to the truth. This is the believer. A believer does not have to asub towards any sect. His connection is towards revelation. His connection to the scholars is only because those scholars connect him to the revelation. Not because of the man himself. Not because of that. Our love for Shaykh Al-Albani rahimahullah is not because he was a white, Albanian, European, who moved as a child to Syria. And therefore we love him because he was a white European who became, a, you know, who became an individual who lived in Syria. That's not why we love him. We love Shaykh al-Almani because of the sunnah that he carries. Because of the hadith that he calls us to. Because of the fact that he calls for the revival of that which has been killed by Iblis in the hearts of many. That's why we love Al-Albani. We love Sheikh bin Baz. Not because Sheikh bin Baz was a blind old man. No. We love Sheikh bin Baz. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him. And he is given the title Sheikh al-Islam. Abdulaziz ibn Baz. Rahimahullah. Because he gave to this ummah. He was a reviver of this ummah. A mujaddid. A man who called to the truth. A man who called to the sunnah. So we came to love him because of his adherence to the sunnah. So we don't have to asub towards any individual. Rather we love the scholars because they connect us to the sunnah. We respect them because they connect us to the sunnah. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said that indeed the ulama, they are the warathatul anbiya. They are the inheritors of the Prophet. For indeed the prophets do not leave behind dinar nor dirham. Rather what they leave behind is ilm, is knowledge. And whomsoever takes it has taken a great treasure. In a narration or in the same narration, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that, that everything in the heavens and the earth seeks forgiveness for the scholar. Even the fish in the ocean seek forgiveness for him. Why? Because of his knowledge. Because of what he carries. And what he calls to. So yes, we love the scholars. But we don't have to asub towards any single one of them. We love them due to the truth that they carry. And we follow them in that which they bring by way of evidence from the kitab and the sunnah. This is why we love them. This is why we love Abu Hanifa. And Imam Malik. And Imam Shafi'i. And Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And Abdullah ibn Mubarak. And Imam al-Bukhari. And Imam al-Tirmidhi. And Imam Muslim. Ibn Majah, Abu Dawood, Sufyan al-Thawri, Hamad ibn Salama, Hamad ibn Zayd, Ibn Qayyim, Ibn Taymiyyah, Abdul Ghani al-Maqdasi, Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab. Why do we love all of these ulama? Because they connect us upon that straight path going back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
We love those who love them. And we despise those who despise them. Because they are the inheritors of the Prophet. It is not permissible to despise an inheritor of a Prophet. This is who those scholars are. In our times that we are living in now, every almost every mosque that you see, they will say that our mosque has a scholar and I take my religion from him. So anyone who screams up, or anyone who rubble raises, and anyone who stands up upon the member becomes a scholar to them. Why? Because in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man becomes king. We are living in a land, if you were to memorize five hadith, just five hadith, and maybe ten suwar from the Qur'an, ten chapters from the Qur'an, you were to memorize them, you know more than 95% of the Muslim population in Britain. Just by memorizing five or ten hadith, or five or ten suwar, surahs from the Qur'an. So that is not an example of your immense knowledge. Rather, it is an example of the lack of knowledge of the society around you. You want to know ulama, then you will find ulama in the lands of the Arab, predominantly. In the lands of the Arabian Peninsula, in Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia, in these lands, in Yemen, you will find ulama, scholars, who will guide you towards the book of Allah, towards the sunnah of Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Wallahi, the Salafis, because when we, when we ask, who is the saved sect in our time? There is only one group of individuals in the times that we are living in who adhere to the way of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Because every sect out there says Quran and Sunnah, does it not? Everyone, you say to them, do you follow Quran? Yes, of course I follow Quran and Sunnah. Do you follow? Yes, I follow Quran and Sunnah. He's worshipping at the grave. You say, you follow Quran? Yes, I follow Quran and Sunnah. He's marching in the street on the birthday of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa You know, singing songs all through the night and marching in the streets on, the, on what they claim is the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you tell him, you following Quran and Sunnah? Yes, of course you follow Quran and Sunnah. Huh? You see a person making tawaf around the grave in Pakistan or India, or even you know, in some of the Arab lands, such as Iraq, or, or in Sudan. And you find people making tawaf around the graves. You say, you follow Quran and Sunnah? Yes, I follow Quran and Sunnah. The claim is easy. The words fall off the, fall off the tongue easily. Quran and Sunnah. But Quran and Sunnah is not just merely a claim. Rather, it is not just even Quran and Sunnah. It's Quran and Sunnah and Sahaba. Because without the Sahaba, you have no understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah. In fact, you have no Quran without the Sahaba. The Sahaba pres preserved the Quran. The Sahaba preserved the Sunnah. They are the ones who conveyed from the Prophet ﷺ. I'm sure every one of you has heard the concept of the chain of narration, the Isnad. The chain of narration that connects the text of the Hadith through a chain of narration of men and women sometimes, going all the way back to the Prophet ﷺ. You all heard of the concept, I'm sure. In that chain of narration, every single individual is to be questioned with regard to his truthfulness with regard to his memory, with regard to his trustworthiness, with regard to his precision, with regard to whether he opposes others who are stronger than him. Everyone is to be questioned with regard to the strength of his memory, the strength of his trustworthiness and so on, up until you reach the companions. Do you question the companions? In a chain of narration, when the scholars, they say, we have checked this chain of narration, like Imam al-Bukhari, or Imam Muslim, Imam Abu Dawood, or Tirmidhi, and so on. When they check the chain of narration, they check every narrator. Do they check the companions? Well, let's just check if Abu Huraira is 100% or not. Did he forget? Did he not forget? Did he get confused? Do they say that about the companions? What do you think? Never. The companions, every one of them is trustworthy. So, they'll question the one who sat with the companions. So they'll question, for example, the strength of Nafi, the freed slave of Ibn Umar. They'll question Imam Malik. Imagine. Question his strength and his trustworthiness in narrating hadith. They will question Imam Shafi'i. They will question Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi. 
They will question Abdul Razak al Sanani. They will question Ahmed ibn Hanbal himself. Will they question Abu Huraira? Never. Once it hits the companion, the chain of narration, you stop there. If the companion said the Prophet said it, then the Prophet said it. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You don't say, well, let's check out this companion. If Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said the Prophet ﷺ said it, then he said it. Because all of the companions are trustworthy, every last one of them. They are not to be questioned about their authenticity. Everyone else in the chain of narration is to be questioned. So now in our times, what is the thing that distinguishes the said sect from all of the other sects? What distinguishes us in this time is that we follow the Qur'an and the Sunnah with the understanding of the Sahaba. Not just in statement, but in action. We don't say one thing and do another thing. We don't say Qur'an, Sunnah, Sahaba. Now let's go on the anti-war march outside the House of Parliament in London. Well, you just said Qur'an, Sunnah, Sahaba. What are you going on a march for? Well, you know, we have to live in our times. We love the Sahaba, but we need to live in our times. You say, okay, why are you marching in London for? Anything can be distilled down, my brothers and sisters. Let's distill it down. They go marching in the streets of London. Outside the Houses of Parliament, anti-war demonstration. Stop the war coalition. And you say, but you just said to me, Quran, Sunnah, Sahaba. He said, yes, Quran, Sunnah, Sahaba. So what are you marching for? Is it jihad? They say, yes, it is a form of jihad. Say, mashallah, okay. If it is jihad, then is jihad ibadah? They said, yes, jihad is ibadah. Is ibadah worship? Is it tawqifiyah or is it ishtihadiyah? Is ibadah worship? Is it something that is that has to come from revelation? Or can you make your own conclusion in ibadah? For example, I feel really pious tonight. So I'm going to pray 13 raka'as for maghrib. Is it allowed? So instead of praying 3, I'm going to pray 13. Is it allowed? Yes or no? Why not? Did the Prophet ﷺ don't pray 13? Did he say don't pray 13? He didn't say don't pray 13. Did he say don't pray 5? He didn't say don't pray 5. All he said was, pray 3. So why can't I pray 5? Or, or 8? Or 13? Or 21 for Maghrib? What prevents me? What prevents me is that statement of Sufyan or uh, Imam al awzai stop where the people before you stopped. What suffices them, suffices you. And the Prophet ﷺ stated, every bid'ah is misguidance, and every misguidance is in the hellfire. So the Prophet ﷺ did not exceed upon three for Maghrib. So we do not exceed upon three. He prayed the two nafal afterwards, but he did not exceed upon the three for the fard of, of Maghrib. Agreed? So now every point of ibadah, every aspect of ibadah is like that. If something is considered to be an act of worship, then there must be a textual evidence to show that it is allowed. If the Prophet ﷺ was able to do it, then he would have done it. Or if the Prophet ﷺ was commanded to do it, then he would have done it. Did the Prophet ﷺ ever go out marching in the streets of Mecca? Don't tell me you saw the message. Wallahi. <laughs> Remember I was, speak, I was giving a lecture, I think it was in London, one of the universities. One of the, this sect called Al-Muhajirun, I prefer to call them Al-Mujrimun. He stood up and he, I said, there is no evidence for rallies and demonstrations in the streets. He said, yes there is. I said, what's your evidence? He said, the companions did it. They marched to the Kaaba. I said, where's the evidence? I saw it in the message. <laughs> oh, mashallah. I saw it in the message. Alright, so that's the evidence now. He saw it in a movie. Oh, mashallah. This is the problem with the ummah in our times. That the evidence is no longer hadith of the Prophet Wasallam. Evidence is hearsay. It looks good, feels good. What are we going to do if we don't do that? I mean, that's another argument that they bring. If we don't march in the streets, then what else do we do? You're patient. And you do that which Allah commanded. You don't invent things because you don't have a text, so I'm going to invent a text. 
one of them said, in one of his writings, he said, uh, well, there's a hadith of Umar ibn Khattab when he entered into Islam. The Umar ibn Khattab and Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, now after he embraced Islam, the Umar, he formed two rows. Umar stood at the head of one, and Hamza stood at the head of the other. And they formed a line, and they walked to the Kaaba. And they prayed in the Haram. I said, yes. He said, there you go. I said, there you go what? He said, that was a demonstration. I said, what demonstration? He said, that was a demonstration. I said, first of all, the hadith is weak. Ibn Hajr and others have mentioned that there's a narrator in the hadith who is matruk. He's abandoned. Secondly, that even if it was true, where is the evidence for demonstration? What did they do? Did they fight anyone? Did they have placards? Did they scream and shout? Did they say down with Abu Jahl and down with Abu Sufyan? And, you know, the Kaaba is for the Muslims only and kick out the mushriks from the Kaaba. Any of this? Nothing. Even if you hold the narration to be authentic, and it's not authentic. But even if you hold it to be authentic, the most you can get out of it is that two lines were formed and they marched or they walked to the Kaaba and they prayed therein. Or they prayed around the Kaaba. That's the most you can get out of it. Going back to the issue of demonstrations. So therefore, if it is jihad, jihad is an act of worship. You cannot introduce an act of worship without an evidence. So where's your evidence that this is a form of jihad marching in the streets? They say, okay, it's not jihad. And they're okay, what is it then? It's da'wah. And then mashallah, da'wah is not ibadah. That was ibadah, his worship. So where's your evidence that this was used, demonstrations, placards, and marching in the streets calling for the downfall of this government and that government, and the removal of these troops and that army, that the Prophet ﷺ ever used this as a means of da'wah. No evidence. So therefore what are you marching for? So therefore how is your attachment to the Qur'an and Sunnah and Sahaba? No attachment. Your attachment is a false attachment. Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullah, he rightly said that these demonstrations and marches and rallies are from the affairs of the non-Muslims, the disbelievers. And the Muslims follow this example of this and they use it as a means of rectification. And it is not a means of rectification because as Imam Malik ibn Anas rahimahullah said, the latter part of this ummah will not be rectified except that which rectified its earliest part. Except by that which rectified this earliest part. So you see that there's a lot of people out there who say Quran, Sunnah, Sahaba. And there's a lot of sects out there. And I've mentioned some examples of some of the things that they do. But this really requires not a dars, durus, to go through some of the things that the various sects of our times do. Whether they be Mu'tazila, whether they be one of the sects of Sufiya, such as the Naqshbandiya. You know, there's a narration of one of them, one of the Sufis, one of the greatest Heads of, of, of Sufism in his era was an individual known as Sha'arani. Now this Sha'arani is regarded as a saint among Sufis, as one of the greatest of the saints. And likewise, a rifai Now this individual, he mentions that on an occasion that his Sheikh, a rifai that he set his eyes upon a dog. As soon as he set his eyes upon that dog, then all of the dogs of that village started coming to him, seeking dua from him. Right? Remember, Quran, Sunnah, Sahaba we're talking about. Quran, Sunnah, Sahaba. Where is the Quran and Sunnah, Sahaba there? Then they say when he died, then all of the dogs, they wept and cried at the death of this dog. Then they buried the dog and they built a shrine over his grave, and then the people started going to the shrine of the dog. Ajib. Quran, Sunnah, Sahaba. Easy to say, because everyone claims it. But there's only a group of individuals that are truly upon it, and they will remain. They will remain till the end of time. As the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu said, they will not cease to remain a group of my Ummah, manifestly upon the truth, unharmed by those who oppose them, and those or those who, who differ with them and those who quit them or abandon them. 
and they will remain ala al haq zahirin upon the truth manifestly upon the truth and they will remain in that state up until the command of Allah comes in a narration up until the descent of Jesus the son of Mary alayhi salam so this group will remain upon the truth in every era and every time in this time then i say if it is not the salafiyun if it is not the salafis then it is no one in which case it is the salafis because they will remain those salafis who are upon that which bin baz ibn uthaymin al albani sheikh rabi' sheikh muqbil sheikh ahmed al najmi sheikh abd rahman ibn sa'di the mashaykh of the children and the grandchildren of sheikh islam the mujaddid and the imam of the da'wah muhammad bin abdul wahhab the people who adhere to their path and the path of those who came before them and in their era that those in the era of muhammad bin abdul wahhab imam al-shawkani those who came before them were they by centuries such as sheikh islam ibn taymiyyah 728 or his student ibn qayyim or his other students ibn kathir ibn rajab or other than them from those who came before the likes of imam al-nawawi those who came before him the likes of abdul ghani al-maqdisi and ibn qudama those who came before them the likes of barbahari those who came before them the likes of al-marwazi and abdullah bin imam ahmed and then the likes of his father ahmed ibn hanbal and his companions ishaq bin ibrahim ar-rahawi or rahawiya and abdul rahman ibn mahdi and ali al-madini and those that they took from the likes of imam al-shafi'i and fudayl ibn iyad and abdullah ibn mubarak and then they, those who they took from now we've entered into the time of the atba'u tabi'in the likes of sufyan al-thawri and imam al-awza'i and imam al-zuhri and ayyub al-sakhtiyani and those that they took from them, the tabi'in the likes of umar bin abdul aziz and hasan al-basri muhammad ibn sirin sayyid ibn musayyib ikrima these ulama a silsila a chain that goes all the way back to the salaf of this ummah and who did they take from the last group that i mentioned directly from the companions the abadila abdullah ibn umar abdullah ibn mas'ud abdullah ibn abbas abdullah ibn zubair the great ulama of that time the great sahaba aisha um salama abu huraira umar ibn khattab and they in turn took from who the messenger of allah and the messenger of allah in turn took from who jibril and jibril took from who allah jalla wa ala our chain of narration goes to allah my brothers and sisters subhanahu wa ta'ala وما ينطق عن الهوى ان هو الا وحي يوحى هي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم never spoke from his desires but rather it was revelation that was conveyed to him the salafi is the individual not just the one who claims it because there's some foolish people out there who claim to be salafi who ascribe themselves to be salafi and they are the furthest thing from salafia but the salafi is the sunni is the athari who sticks to that path in every age every generation without fail without turning to one side nor the left nor the right sticking upon that path they are mountains like mountains pegged into the earth they do not waver they do not blow in the breeze they do not answer the call of every screamer that calls out they are not rubble as ishaq ibn ibrahim mentioned them to be they are not rubble they don't follow personalities they are not individuals that when the fitna hits that they begin to sway and swing in the breeze their backs are upright they are sturdy their backbone is strong why because their composition is strong because their knowledge is strong they love allah they will not compromise this religion they will not be slayed, swayed by the people of hizbiya they will not be called by the cults and by the sects 
They will not be deceived by those who come in the garbs of Salafiyyah, claiming that they're Salafi. Whether it be Abu Hassan Al-Ma'rabi, whether it be Ali Hassan Al-Halabi, whether it be anyone else from the people of deviation, from the corners of Ihya Al-Turab, or whether it be the likes of Suhaib Hassan, they are not swayed by these individuals who outwardly come with Salafiyyah, and then they hide their Hizbiyyah. And they hide their deviation. You're not swayed by them. Why? Because we are individuals, my brothers and sisters, who have been commanded with istiqama in times of ease and in times of hardship. Do not be like that individual. And those individuals that we have known over 20, in, in nearly 20 years of da'wah, that he prays with you. He's in the front row. Or in the rows of the salah with you, heel to heel, ankle to ankle, shoulder to shoulder. And as soon as the fitna strikes, you come to the prayer, he's disappeared. You say, where's he gone? He was with me yesterday. Say, Akhi, they took him. Shubahat. Doubts. He listened to them and they took him. And he fell into misguidance. Don't be like that, my brothers and sisters. Be with the likes of Sheikh Rabia. The Imam of Jahwa Ta'adil in our times. Be with the likes of Ubaid al Jabri, Fawzan, Al Ghudayan, Abdul Aziz al Sheikh. Be with those ulama. Those ulama rasikhun fil ilm, as Allah describes them. That they are firmly grounded in knowledge. And be there Allah Ta'ala, you will not go astray so long as you remain sincere, truthful, upright. And don't answer the call of every screamer that calls out, no matter how emotional he may sound. Quran, Sunnah, Sahaba, that is our path. Stick to the books of Aqidah of old. If a person is teaching you books of today, that he's written his own book from his own mind, with his own opinions, don't sit with them. Don't sit with Jamaat al Tabligh, who follow a book that is 80% weak and fabricated hadith. Innovations that the Ummah has never known. A jama'a that arose in the 1920s. Don't sit with Al-Ikhwan Al-Muslimin. This organization that was founded in the 1920s and 30s by Hassan Al-Banna. And revived again in the 1950s and 60s by Sayyid Qutb. And is headed in our times by the likes of Yusuf Al-Qardawi. Don't sit with those individuals. They will lead you astray. I do not say this to you. Just as a means of calling you to me. I may never see you again. And that is not really the issue whether I see you again or not. The issue is that you are individuals who came, came to Islam, came to iltizam, or came to istiqama rather, came to practicing your religion for the sake of Allah, not for the sake of men. Quran, Sunnah, Sahaba. Be aware of the people of innovation. The Salaf had ijma, as Imam al baghawi mentioned. That it is an ijma, a consensus that we do not sit with the people of desires. Why? Because they will whisper things in your ears. They will enter your hearts and they will lead you astray. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Jazakumullahu khairan. If I can quickly deal with some of these questions before I finish. What are the books to be read after the books of Shaykh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab? Then no doubt, <coughs> the books of Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah are, the, are books that an individual should adhere to and stick to and read not just once but study over and over. But not by yourself but with the help of the scholars. If you can get a good explanation of them on the likes of Ibn Uthaymeen, they recorded and even printed in book form. Then read through that. The explanation of Shaykh Ubaid al-Jabri, recorded and translated into English on tape and in text. Likewise, the explanation of Rasul al-Thalatha by Shaykh Abdul Aziz bin Baz. Explanation of Rasul al-Thalatha by many of the scholars of the Ummah, Shaykh al-Fawzan and others. Likewise, Kitab al-Tawheed, which is a book that has been explained by many of the scholars of our times. From them, Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, 
from them, which is probably one of the most beautiful explanations of our times, Sheikh Ibn Taymin's Qawlul Mufid, in explanation of Kitab al-Tawheed. Also, Qawaid al-Arba, which is now published in English also, the four fundamental principles, with the explanation of Sheikh al-Fawzan, Sheikh uh, Ubaid al-Jabari also has an explanation, as do some of the other scholars. Likewise, Usul al-Sitta, it has good explanation from Sheikh Ubaid al-Jabari. On CD, it is recorded from Sheikh Fala bin Ismail al-Mundikar, and it is available on audio. These are the basic books that an individual should begin with. After that, then the books, all of the books of Muhammad bin Abdul, Masail al-Jahiliya, Kashf al-Shubahat, all of these books are excellent books. Likewise, after that, the books, and all of these books are books in Aqeedah and Tawheed. The books of Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, al wasithiya this is the first one from the books of Ibn Taymiyyah that a person should enter into with a good explanation from a good Salafi scholar. The likes of Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah is probably the, one of the best ones available. Also, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Salih Al-Fawzan, a good solid explanation simplified. And some of the other scholars have explanations of this. It's also available in audio in English from uh, Sheikh Fala Ismail Al-Mundikar and it's translating, it's available in audio. Also, the rest of the books of Ibn Taymiyyah, at Al-Muriyah, Al-Hamawiyah, all of these books are excellent books, but you begin with Wasatiya. In Fiqh, then Shaykh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, rahimahullah, used to advise with Bulugh Al-Maram, that a person can take it and read it himself, and he will benefit immensely from it. Ideally, a teacher would teach you. Shaykh Al-Fawzan has a beautiful explanation that has recently dropped, or recently been published, and it's excellent. It's Subul Al-Salam, of course, that is also available, which is a slightly older explanation. All of them excellent and good explanations. Likewise in Fiqh, Umdatul Fiqh, which is excellent. There's a nice, uh, various chapters of it being explained by Sheikh Ubaid al-Jabari. Excellent book to enter into. Umdatul Fiqh. So all of these books are excellent. Works that a person may enter and study, and study well. And memorize of course the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because this is before all of this anyway. That a person should be constant in reciting the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he should not, as Uthman bin Affan radiallahu anhu said, that not a day goes by except that I look into the Mus'haf. And when he died, he died radiallahu anhu when they assassinated him, that he was reading his Mus'haf at the time. And he was an old tatty cop uh, tattered copy that he had for many years radiallahu anhu. And, the, and of course the Qur'an is something that is explained by tafsir. And from the best of those tafsir that is simple and easy to enter into is the tafsir of Imam Sa'di, Abdul Rahman bin Sa'di, the teacher of Ibn Thaymin. And likewise, Ibn Thaymin also has taken ajza and those, those, those uh, chapters of the Quran or those portions of the Quran and that he has explained them. And many of them are published now in Arabic. In English, the tafsir of Ibn Kathir is available in the English translation now, published by Darul Salam. And it is a good entry, no doubt. Of course, not everything in it is authentic, because that was not the intent of Ibn Kathir. But it was a general explanation of the various ayat of the Book of Allah. Shaykh Muqbil rahimahullah started and embarked upon the checking of the tafsir of Ibn Kathir. But he did not complete it. But nevertheless, there are some excellent tafsir and commentaries of the Qur'an that are available. Then after that, a person, once he's upon the path of knowledge, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open up avenues for him. If you can study, then study. The best place in the world to study right now, without doubt, is Riyadh. With Shaykh al-Fawzan, Shaykh Abdullah Ghudiyan, Shaykh al-Muhidan, you know, those great scholars in Riyadh, and likewise in Medina, Shaykh Abdul Muslim al-Abbad, Shaykh Ubaid al-Jabari, Ali Nasr al-Faqihi, Shaykh Salih al-Suhaymi, all of those mashaykh, excellent mashaykh, that person can travel to, to Riyadh or Medina and study. Likewise in Mecca, you have the likes of Sheikh uh, Ahmed Bazmul and his brother Muhammad bin Umar Bazmul, and likewise Sheikh Rabi, also in Mecca. In Samita, we have the likes of Sheikh Zayd al-Madkhali, you can travel to and you can study with. And likewise the various mashaykh in Yemen, and the various camps that they have, and the various masajid and marakis, that a person can travel to them and benefit from them. And likewise, we have the Mashaykh of Kuwait, that you can also go and you can benefit from them. The likes of Sheikh Ahmed al-Subai, his brother Tariq al-Subai, both of them good, strong Mashaykh of Kuwait. 
And likewise, Sheikh Falah bin Ismail al Mundikar. And also, we have there Sheikh Muhammad al Anjiri and others from amongst the Mashaykh that you can benefit from. So, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not closed the doors for you. The doors are open for you to study. If you can't travel right now, it doesn't mean that you give up your studies. Enhance your studies. Learn your deen even whilst you're here. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of lectures of Salafi mashayikh that are available. And Salafi students of knowledge. The likes of our brother Abu Hakim, Abu brother Abu Talha, Hassan al Somali, Abu Iyad Amjad Rafiq, Abu al Hassan Malik in America, Kashif Khan also from America. All of these lectures are available. And you should benefit from them. Abu Awais, uh, Abdullah Ahmed Ali, Rahimahullah, who died recently. That all of their lectures are available on CD. Your house should be pumping with these lectures. So your children are hearing them night and day. And likewise, the Mashaykh, all of their CDs that I've mentioned, Sheikh Falah, Sheikh Ubaid, Sheikh Rabi, how many hundreds have been translated? So even though you can't travel for now, fill your heads with these lectures. Benefit whilst you're here. Benefit yourselves in the Arabic language. If there's a Salafi brother, don't sit with the people of Bid'ah. Don't learn Arabic from them. Don't learn Quran from them. Don't learn Hadith from them. Don't learn anything from them. Not even Kitab al-Tawheed of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab from them. Not from the people of Hizbiyyah and the people of Bid'ah. Rather the books and the Arabic language and the Quran should be studied with Salafis. Not with the people of Hizbiyyah. With the people of partisanship. Those who set up principles that oppose the Qur'an and the Sunnah, you don't study with them. You keep away from them. And likewise, you do not sit and study with those people who call to themselves. Even if they ascribe themselves to Salafiyyah. If they have a little cult following around themselves, and they disconnect themselves from the rest of society, and from the rest of the community, and from the rest of the Salafi community in the UK, or in the world for that matter, those individuals are headed upon a path of destruction. Don't waste your time sitting with them, because sooner or later they will lead you astray. If they don't have connection with Ahlul Ilm, if they don't have a connection with the Ulama, Rasikhun Fil Ilm, well grounded in knowledge, they don't have a connection with their Salafi counterparts in the rest of the country, or in the rest of the continent, and those individuals then they are upon a path that will lead them eventually to destruction due to their distance from Ahlul Ilm, due to their distance from the scholars. والله تعالى أعلم. Is it permissible to raise money? I won't name the organization, but there's an organization mentioned here, <laughs> a British organization that attaches itself to the Sunnah. Should, uh, is it permissible to raise money for them? No, you don't raise money for any individual that you know is a person of Hizbiya. Or that his da'wah is a da'wah siyasiyah. And Sheikh Ubaid, Al-Jabri, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Hadi, Sheikh Muqbil, bin Hadi al-Wadi'i, and many of the ulama have mentioned the deviation of this organization that attaches itself to hadith. That they have mentioned that they are upon deviation, even though they call themselves the people of hadith. That you do not fundraise for them, nor should you have close ties to them. Why? Because they have been infiltrated by the people of Bid'ah and deviation. So amongst their ranks you will find the likes of Bilal Phillips, Yasir Qadi, Zakir Naik, and these types of individuals who have nothing whatsoever to do with Salafiyyah. Yes, they may be great speakers that may impress you, because it's not difficult to impress a person, memorize three hadith and you've impressed half the population. It's not an issue of impressing, it's an issue of is their connection to the aqidah of the Sahaba. And if it's not, then we do not attach ourselves to them. This organization is a buffer organization. Like a sponge. If you put a sponge on the table, if I pour water on this side of the sponge, the sponge soaks up the water. My right, simple science. Uh, the sponge will soak up the water. Eventually the water will come out on which side? On the other side. So what they do is that the Salafis are on this side, they're the sponge. They soak up the water and they soak up the Salafis claiming to come to you in the garbs of Salafiyyah. And then they take you to the direction of bid'ah and misguidance. So don't go near them. 
Because that's what happens with those types of individuals. Sheikh Ubaid said, they are to be described as a jama'a siyasiyya. A jama'a, an organ, a political organization, or a political jama'a. They are not a jama'a that follows the sunnah as it should be followed. So no, don't fundraise for them, and don't aid them, and don't aid the one who aids them. Rather, advise him, give him da'wah, and tell him about their deviation, if you're able to do so. Can you please make it to Bradford next week? No. <laughs> Unfortunately, even though I'd love to. All of them in the fire except for one. Which of these sects will stay in the fire forever? Then the correct opinion is that none of the sects of deviation will remain in the hellfire for eternity. Because they are all amongst the ranks of the Muslims. There may be individuals who ascribe themselves to some of these sects that may remain there for eternity due to their extremism. Like for example an individual who worships and calls upon the dead in his grave. He says, O Fulan in your grave, cure me, aid me, help me, give me a child, make my wife pregnant. If he does that, then he is making direct dua and isti'ana or istighatha or he's asking them for shifa. If he does that, then that person has fallen into major shirk. Then it is feared for that individual that he will remain in the hellfire for, an etern for eternity without ever coming out. But the general rule is that all of the 72 sects that enter into the hellfire, that eventually they will be removed. Why? Because they are from this ummah. But the difference is that the saved sect, that they will not enter into the hellfire due to any deviation that is with them. Why do some of the Salafi Masajid mosques that join Maghrib and Isha during the summer in England not do it from the start of the English summertime? <laughs> Allahu A'lam why they don't do it from the start of the... You have to ask them. But <clears throat> the permissibility of combining between Maghrib and Isha in the summer months, then it is something that is permissible. There's a narration of Abdullah ibn Abbas reported in Bukhari or Muslim when Abdullah ibn Abbas said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam combined between Dhuhr and Asr. He combined Dhuhr and Asr. And then he combined Maghrib and Isha. And he said that we were not in a state of fear and nor was it raining. We were not in a state of fear nor was it raining. And he mentioned that this was so that the Ummah would not be burdened. So therefore this establishes for us that the scholars use this hadith under the headings of the Bab of combining or the chapter of combining for a need. If there's a need that a Muslim perceives, it is permissible to combine between uh, Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha only. You cannot combine, for example, Isha and Fajr. You know, I've heard that before. He said, Akhi, don't worry, I prayed Maghrib, Isha and Fajr. Right? No, no. Only, Prophet only combined between Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha. Right? Fajr is prayed at his proper time. So, that is allowed. And you can see that the Prophet ﷺ did this in, in Medina. And it was not raining, because normally in, the, in rain, it is established from other hadith, that the Prophet ﷺ used to command the Mu'addin to say, Sallu fi biyutikum. Pray in your homes, when it was raining. And in the masjid, those who arrived to the masjid, the Prophet ﷺ used to combine the prayer. So he used to combine, if it was raining at Dhuhr time, Combine Dhuhr with Asr. If it's raining at Maghrib time, combine Maghrib with Isha. And this was something the Prophet Sallallahu did. So now, the issue of combining in the summer months. Is there a need? Then some of the scholars like Shaykh Ibn Uthaymeen, Shaykh Ubaid al-Jabari, Shaykh Muhammad Ibn Hadi al-Madkhali, that these mashayikh and these ulama, they see that, the, that it is permissible to combine. Others say that there's no need to combine. No big deal. So there's no need to combine. But those that see the combination, they say that it is allowable from them, the three mashayikh that I've mentioned. They say that it is permissible to combine Maghrib and Isha at Maghrib time. Why? Because of the lateness of Isha. The Isha now is prayed after 11 p.m. sometimes in summer. And Fajr is somewhere in the region of 3 p.m. Or 3 a.m. of 1. 11 p.m. Isha, 
3 a.m. Fajr. So the time between Isha and Fajr is very close. So it'd be hard for people now to wake up for Fajr and pray in Jama'ah. So for them, for the people of the Masajid, for the, for the Imams of the Masjid, and those committees that run the Masajid, it is permissible for them, if they choose, obviously not obligatory upon them, if they choose and they see a need, that they can combine Maghrib and Isha. The rest of the Jama'ah should not argue with them in this affair. Why? Because Allah has made them Mas'ulun. Allah has made them and place them in a responsibility over the masjid. Not you, not me, them. So if they decide that they're going to combine, it is not upon the rest of the congregation to become angry with them and shout at them and call them lazy. Well, you don't want to pray anyway. You're just trying to make it easy. No problem, we are trying to make it easy. But this ease is permissible in the Sharia. Aisha radiallahu anha said, if the Prophet ﷺ was given two options, an easy one or a hard one, which one did he choose? Easy. Not the hard one, the easy one. Whenever he was given an option, hard and easy, he always chose the easy one. You're going to accuse him of being lazy and not wanting to make ibadah? Of course not. When the Prophet ﷺ was upon a journey, the companions radiallahu anhum, they used to break their fast. Some of them kept it. The Prophet ﷺ said, it is not from birr. The one who fasts upon a journey. It is not from piety that a person fasts upon a journey. So many of the companions used to break their fast. Some of them they used to keep it. But they never criticized each other. So this is a rukhsa. It's an allowance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you to combine. If the masjid committee decides to combine, then combine with them. I've seen something strange in recent years, even in our masjid in Birmingham. The imam, he leads the people in prayer for maghrib. Then the Mu'addin stands up and calls the Iqama for Isha. Then 70 or 80 people walk out the masjid. And he said, what do you walk out for? The response, the Prophet ﷺ said, the best prayer is at its proper time. The best prayer is at its correct time. So they say, therefore, we're not going to combine with the Imam. We're going to pray Isha at Isha time. This shows the lack of fiqh and understanding of this affair. Shaykh Abdul Aziz bin Baz rahimahullah, and he quotes from Ibn Qudama, Ibn Taymiyyah, Imam al-Nawawi and others, that Ibn Shaykh Ibn Bazi mentions a point. He mentions, let's look at the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam combined in the masjid, Maghrib and Isha, he prayed Maghrib, then the Iqama was called, and he prayed Isha. Did any of the companions walk out of the masjid? Not known. Not a single companion walked out of the masjid. Not one of them. So he said, why? Why did they not use the argument that the best prayer is at its proper time? So therefore, Jazakumullah khairan, Ya Rasulullah, but we will pray at Isha, at Isha time. None of them used that argument. Why? Because Shaykh Abdul Aziz bin Baz said, because the jama'ah takes precedence over the prayer at its proper time. What takes precedence? Jama'ah. That you pray behind the Imam and with the body of Muslims and then you go home. And you do not return back to the masjid. And this is the way of the sunnah of Allah's Messenger wasallam. So now why would a person, after the Maghrib prayer has been prayed, why would he walk out the masjid? When all of the companions remain, he can say, well I disagree with the combining. What is more important, your disagreement in this issue of ijtihad or the jama'ah? What's more important? Jama'ah. No doubt, the jama'ah. Why? Because it is not upon everybody to make their decision as to whether the rain is strong enough to combine, whether the snow is hard enough to combine, whether the weather is cold enough to combine. It's not upon everyone to make that decision because every single one of us, and what is there in here? Maybe... You know, 60 brothers or maybe less. Huh? Now, if I was to ask every single one of you your opinion, well, I don't think and I think, well, I think, I think sometimes yes, but sometimes, and sometimes the brothers are too quick to combine. Sometimes the brothers, you know, they should combine and they don't combine. By the time you've made your decision, Maghrib finished. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed individuals with this mas'uliyah with this responsibility to decide. In the time of the Prophet ﷺ, he was the messenger himself. 
used to command the Mu'addin after the Messenger of Allah, Abu Bakr. Those who are responsible over the Muslims. In this masjid, you have a committee. This committee, right, whether you agree with them or disagree with them, that they may decide to combine. Then you combine with them. You don't break from the jama'ah. His body must remain united. And don't think, well, I want the hardship because hardship is good. No, not always. Take the ease that they have decided for you. And this is the way, my brothers and sisters, that you should be with the, with the brothers in this masjid. Be malleable. Be easygoing with them. Because in this manner, that you'll find that this brotherhood will be maintained. You know, this, this ta'alluf, this, this, this harmony will be maintained between you. Which one is the jama'ah? The first one or those who come back? Let me ask you a question. How many times is the jama'ah established in the masjid in a day? Five or six? Five. Why? Because there's five daily prayers. Right? That's what we all, that's what we all know. Anyone know any difference to that? Good. Five pillars of Islam. Shahadatain. Five daily prayers. Five daily prayers, not six. So when the Imam combines the prayer, he has prayed. When he combines Maghrib and Isha, he has finished the fifth prayer. Has he not? Now, when the people say, I'm walking out, and I will come back and establish another Jama'ah at Isha time. My question, did the companions do this? Is it known? If they did it, maybe I haven't come across the text. Maybe it's there and I haven't come across it. If you've come across it, then let me know. Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, rahimahullah, he mentioned that it is not known that any of them left and came back later. They all prayed together. Now either we're going to follow that example of the Sahaba, or we're going to invent our own example. So therefore, do you close, do you lock the masjid at night? I presume we do in this area. Yeah. <laughs> Can't be leaving this place open. Right, so you close the masjid at night. My advice, same advice of Sheikh Fala and some of the other mashaykh, after Maghrib, leave it open for about half an hour after you've combined Maghrib and Isha, and close the masjid and go home. Up until Fajr. You've prayed your five daily prayers in Jama'ah. Obviously, the asal of any masjid is that a masjid is open 24 hours a day. But living in the times that we're living in, if you open this masjid 24 hours a day, you know, you'll come back tomorrow morning carpet gun. Come back the following morning doors gun. Come back the following morning ampl amplifier, speakers, fans, everything gun. You know, that's what the radiators off their hinges, everything gun. You know, because metal is expensive in these times. Yeah. It'll be gun. So therefore, I would advise the brothers, after Maghrib, wait for about half an hour, people make dhikr, they can pray their nafal, whatever, witr, whatever they need to pray. And then khalas, close the masjid, come back at Fajr. Don't make a second jama'ah for Isha. Isha has already prayed, been prayed in jama'ah, in the masjid. Of course, for the travelers, or those who, are, who, who didn't know that it was combined, they may come later. They may come later. If they find the masjid closed, are they not rewarded for their intention? The Prophet ﷺ states in the hadith, the one who strives to meet the jama'ah, to reach the jama'ah, but when he, re when he gets there, and he reaches the jama'ah, he's found that it's finished. Then he will be written for him as if he prayed in jama'ah. So okay, it's possible that some people may not know that this masjid closes after maghrib. We put a notice on the door. That this masjid closes half an hour after Maghrib, because during the month of summer, you know, June, July, August, that we combine between Maghrib and Isha, in accordance to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, allowing the combining, and in accordance to the ishtihad of the scholars based upon that hadith. Simple. This is how it should be. Therefore, you maintain the jama'ah. You don't have to argue about everything. You know, keep, keep yourselves distant from these... You know, these argumentations, this jidal and khusumat, argumentations and disputations. Leave the affair in the hands of the brothers who are in charge of the masjid. And they are trusted enough. They are trusted enough that they will refer their affairs back to Ahlul Hilm. If you are in doubt as to what they are doing, ask them. Akhi, you did something today or there is something being done in the masjid. 
What's the evidence for that? Do you have a scholar with you? What did he say? What was the hadith? Either he'll answer, or he'll put you onto someone who can answer. No harm. Barakallahu feekum. Upon that note, we'll leave you. I thank you for your patience throughout the whole of this lecture. Wa subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Barakallahu feekum. بارك الله فيكم أخي جزاك الله خير ما شاء الله كيف الحال حياكم الله كيف الحال أخي بارك الله فيك